All right, welcome everyone to the uh, Practical alternati Alternative Energy Panel. Uh, again, we had some technical difficulties with getting a projector here, so I encourage everyone to come forward. I'll try to show what I have on my laptop, and I'll stick around afterwards if anyone wants to get a closer look at anything. So my name is uh, Pedro Aguiar, and I'll be discussing uh, making homemade biodiesel. Uh, Bob Forshe is going to talk about wood gasification. Uh, Bill Domenico is going to talk about solar inverter battery uh, electrical systems. And the fourth panelist, Christian Pennepacker, is possibly going to make it, possibly not. Uh, but he was going to talk about his grease-powered car and to have it here on display. I can talk a little bit uh, and fill in for him uh, if he can't make it. So with that, uh, let me get started with uh, biodiesel. So uh, what is biodiesel? So biodiesel is a method of taking vegetable oil, putting it through a chemical reaction, which replaces the glycerin with alcohol. And what that's going to do is it's going to turn the viscosity of that fuel into something that's approximately the same as diesel. So it can be mixed with diesel. Uh, it could be run 100%, um, and it, it, it is a drop-in replacement for um, what we call dyno diesel, which is the stuff you get from the ground. Um, some of the other points are it's uh, extremely safe. Its flash point is over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, so it is a safe fuel. It's a fuel that if you spill some into the environment, it's going to naturally break down uh, through bacteria, so there's no hazmat type cleanup process if there is an accident with uh, biodiesel. It is still flammable, so you do want to keep that in mind. Uh, the other interesting thing about um, biodiesel is it's actually good for diesel engines, better than diesel fuel. It's both a solvent, like gasoline, and a lubricant, like diesel. So it, it's very good at keeping the engine clean. And actually, in, um, in Minnesota, they require, government requires that you have 3% minimum biodiesel for all the diesel sold in the state. Um, obviously, that's not the way we want to go about things. So basically, the way you get um, biodiesel is you take vegetable oil. You can also make it from animal fats. Uh, you do need to have more chemicals to do the uh, animal fat reaction. Uh, but you take the vegetable oil, you heat it up, and you add to it uh, an alcohol, which we use methanol, and a catalyst, which you can use sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is lye. Uh, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and they have the straight crystal lye, you can actually use that to make biodiesel. In the end, in the, end the reaction is going to result in biodiesel and glycerin. So. Um, you essentially make it in a processor, and the processor is just really a mixing uh, vessel. Because we have to heat it, it's good to have it insulated. You're going to use less energy to get it to that temperature. Uh, one of the popular home brew methods is to use an electric water tank. Uh, electric because you want to apply heat in a non-flammable manner because you are working with methanol. Um, so methanol is uh, a fuel that when you're on fire, no one sees you're on fire. So want to be careful with that. So we, we pour the oil into the processor. We heat the oil to 120 degrees. When the oil is heating, what we need to do is what's called a titration test. Because it's used oil, there's going to be, um, especially if it comes from restaurants, there might be animal fats in it. So the amount of catalyst that's required is going to vary somewhat. So we have a base level, which is 5 grams per liter. And then we need to find out, based on the amount of animal fats or triglycerides that are in the, in the oil, how much extra to put in. And, and it sounds complicated, but it's a very easy test. You can get a kit. You basically measure out some of the oil. You then drop in the solution, and it, it does a color test. And when that color test changes, you're able to see how much you added in there. And then you, you pop that into the uh, recipe book. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So. We find out what that level is, and we mix the lye and the the lye and the methanol together while it's heating, and it's going to cause it's going to create what's called methoxide. Um, once that's up to temperature, we mix 
the methoxide and we keep it agitating. So we want to keep the fuel always moving to make that chemical reaction go through. That's going to take about two hours. At the end of two hours, you have biodiesel and glycerin all in a puree. And the next step is to actually bring it into a vessel that's going to allow it to settle and let all the heavy glycerin settle out. Once that heavy glycerin is at the bottom, biodiesel's at the top. So because it separates, we drain the glycerin out until we just have that layer of, of, of biodiesel. Once that's done, you've essentially had unwashed, untreated biodiesel. Now at this point, the biodiesel has some soaps in it. It has some impurities in it. It's not something you can put in a modern vehicle at this point, but you can put it in things like a diesel generator or uh, home heating oil. You can mix it with that. And the reason is, is that the um, orifices of the injectors for those are big enough that impure biodiesel will work. But let's say you wanted to run this in your vehicle. Well, what you have to do now is you have to wash it and then you have to dry it. Now, why do you want to wash it? Well, there's soaps in there, and soap does not dissolve in oil or biodiesel, but it does dissolve in water. So the way to wash it is in, in the settling tank, you, you mist water. You get some landscape misters, hook it up to a garden hose, and it's going to mist the water. The water is going to hit the top of the oil, and water is heavier than oil, so those tiny droplets are going to fall to the bottom. And as they're falling, they're going to come in contact with soaps and other impurities. And what you'll get is uh, it'll build up a layer of water at the bottom, and then you drain that water out. And that'll look like milk the first time. You do that about four or five times until the water is just barely cloudy. You now have washed biodiesel. Uh, the next step is you want to completely remove that water. So I would move that to a separate tank that basically sucks the biodiesel from the bottom, and then it, it, it it's throws it out over the top, so it kind of fans out, so it has a lot of surface contact with the air, and I like a small fan on top. And what will happen is that will go from a cloudy uh, honey color to clear apple juice color. When, when it's dry, you can put it in a mason jar and look right through it, just as if it was apple juice. And now you're ready to use it. The last step is simply to put it in your gas tank. I would put it through a 5 micron filter. and now I'm running that in my Volkswagen TDI. Um, so that's, that's basically it. There are a lot of steps. And one piece of advice I'd give is you want to make the biggest batch you can because the biggest batch that you make is going to make you more efficient. I was doing 30-gallon uh, batches because that's the water tank that I had. If you had a 100-gallon water tank, you could probably make 80-gallon batches and you know, basically triple what I had. So uh, it, it sounds a little intimidating, but it's actually a recipe process. And there's an excellent spreadsheet, which I'll give you the link at the end. It's called biodiesel omatic And it has the base um, amounts. It has the base amount of methanol, the base amount of the catalyst. You then enter in your titration amount. And it's going to spl split out, spit out, for example, on this one, if I'm making 50 gallons of oil, and I put in my titration level, it tells me that I need 10 gallons of methanol and 43.87 ounces of lye. So I mix that lye into the methanol, I put that into the processor with the oil at 120 degrees, agitate it for two hours, there's biodiesel. That's about as scientific as it gets you know, once, once you get into a, a, a process. So here is a, an example of that hot water tank processor. It, it's called apple seed processor because the spirit uh, is anyone can find a hot water tank and, and make this. It has a clear water pump, three quarter inch. It's got different ball valves that will let you pull in the oil through suction and fill the tank. It then let it, it, you then throw the, um, the ball valves and it's just going to recirculate it. Pull it from the bottom, bring it up on this vinyl to, uh, hose and drop it in at the top. Uh, when you're done mixing your chemicals and you're ready to add that, once it hits 120 degrees, that's what this container is. You throw a different ball valve, it's going to suck that methanol, uh, methoxide, and bring it in there and start the reaction. And when you're done and it's done settling, this is what it'll actually look like. Biodiesel at the top, you'll have heavy glycerin at the bottom. 
the glycerin you can use to make soap. You can, you can just put it out into nature. It'll biodegrade. It, so you even have uses for the glycerin. Uh, a few pieces of important information are biodiesel breaks down rubber like you wouldn't believe. So if you have a car that's older than, say, the mid-90s, you do need to replace any fuel lines with a synthetic. Uh, uh, there's a name brand, Vidon. There's other... Uh, synthetic lines, but you'll need to replace that because it will essentially destroy any, any rubber that it comes in contact with. The other very important thing is uh, the cloud point of biodiesel is a lot higher than regular diesel. So in New Hampshire, you're not going to be running 100% biodiesel in the winter. You know, it's just, it's just going to be a, a solid cake of, of, of mass. So um, in the summer, I was running 100%, and, and it's great to have your tank filled with 100% of the fuel you made and know you're not supporting, you know, wars and, and such. Um, and as the weather got colder, you, you would reduce the, the, the percentage in, to the point where in the winter I was running 5% biodiesel. Uh, some, some more info here is I have some links here if you want to see me after, but um, biodiesel.infopop.cc is a great message form uh, to find things like where do I get methanol. Uh, the lie is pretty easy to get. You can get that online. Methanol can be a little more of a challenge depending on where you live. Um, a lot of big industrial companies want to sell you huge quantities and not 55-gallon drums. Uh, Utah Biodiesel Supply Company uh, is a great online resource to get supplies, titration kits, uh, plans. You can get the complete plumbing, with the exception of the water tank already pre-made for you, if you don't want to have to be running back and forth to Home Depot to put it together. And they also have instructional videos. Um, there's a link here for biodiesel or omatic, or you can just Google that, and it's, it's everywhere. And then the other one is uh, Google Appleseed Biodiesel Processor, and you'll see the plans on, on how to make it. So the question was, how long does it take from beginning to end? So I would say, you know, four hours to get it up to temperature to, to process it. Uh, three days to settle. Once it's settled, then you transfer it. Uh, then you're going to wash it a few cycles. So it depends if you're going to be around to, do the, to be there all afternoon. Uh, and then when you dry it, you can just set that up to, to fan out the biodiesel into the air with a fan and walk away from it for a day. So it, it does take, I would say, maybe five days for it soup to nuts, but it's not five days of you constantly being there. Uh, we are going to have questions at the end, so I'm going to actually uh, turn it over to, to Bob and talk about wood gasification. Hi, I'm Bob Forshee. Uh, I live in Grafton, New Hampshire. Uh, I moved up here from New Jersey. Uh, I guess I bought my house uh, October 2009. So it was a good thing for me, uh, and I like getting involved in things, projects. So got a lot going on with my stuff. Uh, my, what I did was I looked at all the different forms, uh, ways that I can produce energy. And uh, looking at the latitude, being up here, the type of weather we have, and what's growing around here and what's free, I chose wood to be my main source of energy production. Uh, I have a, uh, a central unit that produces the majority of my energy, not 100%, but the majority of my energy, and it also acts as energy storage, thermal energy, <coughs> excuse me, thermal energy. So I took a picture of a uh, extension I put on the house and I call this my uh, boiler room and uh, I didn't do any cleanup or anything but that's exactly what it looks like but there's this a large tank with a door in the front it's 10 feet long six feet diameter it has over 1800 gallons of water in there and in the front where that door is there are two chambers. There's a primary and a secondary chamber. The first one is where you load the wood. Now one of the nice things about, that I liked about this is that 
I only needed a chainsaw really to make this work. It's pretty nice. The other thing I liked about it is 87% efficiency. Now you can get and tweak it, you can get some add-ons to tweak it to 91, which I haven't done that yet, but that's what I've been told. Uh, the other thing is it stores a huge amount of energy. I don't want to turn this into a physics class, but a lot of hot water, like almost 2,000 gallons at like 180 to 200 degrees, it's a lot of energy, okay? The, not just the efficiency of the unit in converting wood into heat energy, but all of us have needs for heat energy as heat all the time. So when you go through conversions, you lose a lot. So for instance, like solar, and I'm not knocking solar because I use solar, and I'll tell you how I use it. You're, you have all these conversions in between, and every time you're getting whacked, you lose, you lose, you lose. Okay, and it's crazy to even like, the craziest thing you could do is like use solar energy to make heat out of it. Where if you can take and use solar energy, make it directly into hot water and store it as hot water when needed, you didn't convert it. You got a lot still remaining. Okay, so for instance, if you take a solar panel, photovoltaic, I think, you know, be like really, really good to get like, what, 16% on them, all right? So that's really good. But what is reality? If it got a little pollen dust on it, down, right? My unit is wasting 13%. How much is a photovoltaic wasting? Think about the difference, okay? plus the storage, no conversion. So what I do with this, this is my centerpiece. From here, I heat my house. I have hot water baseboard. I, I won't take too much time to go into. You guys can ask me questions about that. We have variable rate pumps. And we have uh, uh, valves that only allow enough water to that heating element to make it work in the house. Very, it's very conservative. I also have a greenhouse, and I grow food all winter. Minus 20 degrees outside, food's growing. Really neat. And it doesn't cost me anything, because I get my own wood, <laughs> okay? Uh, another thing, <clears throat> our domestic hot water comes from there. So I'm even running this in July. Not every day, but, you know, from here and there when I need it. Depends on how much sun there is. That's another beauty about wood. I can make massive amounts of heat energy at 2 a.m. in the morning with a blizzard outside. That's nice, okay, and it didn't cost me anything. Also wood, you can store wood for a long time. And if you have a source of wood, and you know New Hampshire's loaded with trees, if you live like where I live, there's a lot of trees. I even burn dead wood, a lot of it. It's fine. I don't have to cut living trees down. Plenty of dead wood around. And briefly, try and say this as quickly. I don't want to hog the whole, the whole show here, but this converts wood, solid wood, into producer gas or syn gas, or you know, there's different names for it. But it is really a combination of hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. Believe it or not, carbon monoxide burns. They have similar uh, energy content as fuel. So they both do a really great job. When my unit comes up to temperature, you can't see anything coming out of the stack. No smoke. It burns at like 2200 degrees Fahrenheit in there. So the first one, the first chamber produces the gas. The second chamber is like a, it just turns into like a blowtorch in there. It's a, it's a much smaller diameter, longer tube, and it's mixed with air, and it goes up to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Regular wood is around 1800, and there's really nothing coming out of there. You don't see it. Really neat. Okay.
I don't want to take too long. Uh, this one, okay, this is another picture here. This is some of the plumbing, and there's heat exchangers, these heat exchangers. We don't pump the water directly, so it may go to a heat exchanger, and then it goes to the greenhouse, and then into the house for domestic hot water, etc. cetera. Uh, can you back up one, just one quick? I forgot to tell you, this stuff up here is a, another solar system, but it is not photovoltaic. Uh, these are vac evacuated tube uh, thermals, okay, uh, on the roof. You'll see a picture of them. Uh, the difference is that these are about 80% efficient of the light that hits them. It gets super hot if you were not to have electricity on these things. When we were doing a switchover, we had an electrician come over. I don't do the electrical work. And uh, he had to disconnect it. And he disconnected it for a little bit too long. The water in the system, which is glycol, went to 420 degrees Fahrenheit. On the roof is an escape valve, and it sounded like one of steam engines. I'm glad it's on the roof, because I think it would just tear my skin right off. <laughs> but anyway, so that's what that is. Okay, next. All right, and then next to that, I have a wood pellet machine for convenience when it's really, really cold out. And I don't want to get up at 2.30 in the morning, throw wood in there, because I don't want my vegetables to freeze at minus 20. I can go to bed and like that and it slows the rate of descent of the water temperature. It's really great. It works. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's a little site view. Uh, these are my solar evacuated tubes here. So again, there's no conversion. This hot water goes into that big tank. So there's a heat exchanger for that. So I'm collecting sunlight on here. And this little house here is that boiler room, okay? Over here, across this space, this is my greenhouse. And the greenhouse uh, runs all year. When it gets to be like minus 20, it was really neat. It looked like, a, like an ice cave in there, really something. Okay, uh, underground is a, is a tubing for it. Okay, hit the next one. Let's see this one here, okay. This is some of the uh, pumps that are in the greenhouse. I have what they call grow tables. So my tables have tubing in them where the hot water from that big tank comes in from underground. And in here, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but there's a, there's a tempering valve and there's pumps. And that, just, that water temperature is set by a little dial and you can you know, see it so you don't cook the, your plants. What happens is, it's very wasteful to try and heat your plants with the atmosphere in the greenhouse in the winter, because you're losing your heat through the plastic like crazy. So what I do is I have the temperature set to like 45 to 49 degrees in the air temperature, and I have a blowers up there, which take the wood heated water, all right, and I have the tables heated through, it's like radiant floor heating, but they heat the roots of the plants. So most of the heat that keeps the plants alive in the winter is in the roots, which is most effective. So we lose very little that way. All right, I'm gonna keep flying. <laughs> okay, uh, down here is just a, is a picture of some of my veggies that are growing, and if you look in here, is some of the, excuse me, the tubing coming up through the ground. What I did is I have rock as a floor, you know. So it's nice for water. The water just goes through when you spill everything and you're watering and stuff. But also it's nice to lay out all the piping and the electrical. Makes it really easy. Okay, hit the next one. And there's some more. There's some tomatoes. Some big other plants over there. I think that's a cabbage. <laughs> Get it again. All right. This is one more. This is a, uh, a distribution uh, manifolds where this is actually the point where the tempered water is distributed to the tables. Each one has a valve, and you can read how many liters per hour is going through there, and each table is individually metered. Okay. Give me another one. <laughs> 
Okay, now we got photovoltaic, which everybody loves. There it is. Okay, why do I have photovoltaic? Well, my wood heating system runs with electricity. I need a little bit of electricity. So I can use a little bit of electricity and leverage that by a huge amount. Okay? So, for instance, I have water pumps to have to move the hot water with. And that big unit, that big uh, wood gasification is called a GARN, G-A-R-N. I have some information up here if you want to see it later. It does have a moving part in it. It has, it has an exhaust fan in it. It's an inducer, it's called. So I need some juice for that. Um, and my solar that you saw on the wall, my thermal solar, I call it, I need electricity for that because I have to keep circulating the glycol through there. Otherwise, it's going to all boil out. So that uh, is all run by electric. It's not a lot, but I need some electric. Okay, well, let's hit the next one. Uh, okay, this is inside. Uh, this is now a workshop that I converted part of it into electrical generation. So I have my inverters and my chargers, which we're going to hear about. And then over here I have my battery bank over there. And then I also have something called a Lister engine and a, a permanent magnet alternator I had built for me. Yeah, I guess we can hit that. Okay, there's another picture. This green thing over here is the neatest thing. I love it. It's, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, it's very primitive. It's a diesel engine. It's a very old design. It's ultra-reliable. It has a very long life. It turns and produces electricity for me at 650 RPMs not 3,000 and something, not 3,600 RPMs. RPMs is what determines the longevity of an engine. If you take an engine and you double the rotational speed of that engine, the life of it goes down one by one over the square of that increase. So there you go. That's the block. So if you can get an engine to run at the low speed like this, you have a very long live engine. The other thing that's neat about it is it's very primitive. It has no water pump, right? There's no ignition system. It doesn't even have a starter on it. It has a crank. I turn it with a crank. Um, it's, it doesn't even have an oil pump in it. It's weird, huh? It just has this big oil bath and it slops around in there. Now, the other thing that I like about it is it will burn veggie oil. And I, I, I do burn veggie oil in it from time to time from restaurants. I don't have to process it. Other than it has to be cleaned. So veggie oil I burn in there. I can, go right to the, I can go right to the food store and buy a gallon of regular vegetable oil if I really needed to. Of course, I've got to pay $7 for that. But, and dump it in. And I've done that just for fun. Uh, we do make our own biodiesel. Um, the other, I won't talk much about it, but one side of that wall that you saw that had the thermal solar controls. The other side of that is an, is an area where we make biodiesel and we use the wood heated water for the processing of the biodiesel instead of paying for the electric. Um, <clears throat> this engine, uh, so we run biodiesel in it too. It'll run petroleum diesel, it'll run kerosene, all kinds of stuff. It's really neat. Uh, it's a, uh, I call it a thumper because it, it's one big cylinder and I really had to use these enormous bolts to bolt it down to the, to the concrete. I think that's the end of my thing, right? Okay, so my whole thing was center it with uh, wood energy as my, my uh, main input. The unit is 325,000 BTUs per hour. I burn it for three hours. That's a lot of heat, okay? And from there, I use my solar uh, photovoltaic to run all the pumps and whatever little things I need. Uh, I, do have a, I, do have, I do have blowers in the, uh, in the greenhouse, so I do have to do that too. And the other thing I'm worried about is if public service goes out, I'm in trouble in the winter. 
you know, because my stuff will freeze. <laughs> so I'm really worried about that. That's why I've got batteries. You, saw, you can't see it well, but there's a, there's a big battery bank in there. Uh, those are nickel iron batteries and not lead acid, which is different. Okay, that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, next up we have Bill Domenico talking about uh, solar, battery, and inverter systems. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Test one, two. Get my glasses on so I can read my notes. <laughs> and now I can't see any of you, so it's perfect. Uh, I hope you're ex as excited as I am to be at Porkfest 10. Anybody here who's its first Porkfest? Geez, only a few. That's too bad. <laughs> I've never seen so many new, new people at Porkfest before. This is my sixth Porkfest. So what I've got here, well, unfortunately, after listening to Bob's talk, I've been to his place, but I've never heard the talk. And I guess solar's obsolete, so I'm just going to, because uh, it's 87% waste, 87% wasted, so there's no sense talking about it. We need to go with wood. Wood is the key here. All right. So um, I've, a few people have got this handout, about 20. I was only expecting 14 people today, uh, and so we didn't have enough of these. And so anybody here already have a solar system? Really? You do. Okay, cool. Oh, you said you live in a cabin. Yeah. And a boat. Okay, cool. So on the front page of this, it shows like a typical layout of a solar system and the components that you need. I'm, I'm not going to go into like the nitty gritty of the whole design. My, my, uh, my idea today was to tell you a couple things that most times get overlooked in solar systems and uh, let you take away the rest of the notes with you to you know, help you research it further. So as you know, you need the solar panels. We're going to look at a system that's uh, probably about 4,000 watts, which probably kind of baseline. How many watts do you have, Bob? Do you know? Uh, to top of your well, head? It'll generate 12,000. Your solar system? Well, with the, from the batteries. Once the batteries are charged, it'll be either through the generator and or the solar. Right, but you don't have a huge solar array. No. No, no you have a. 500 watts. Right, so does he, there you go. So about 4,000 watts for an average home that has uh, moderate energy usage is, is probably a good starting point. Uh, people always ask me. Can I, what can I do with two solar panels? Not much. You can sit around in the dark a lot. So let's go with the 4,000 watt system. You're going to get your 4,000 watts from your solar panels. The power from your solar panels is going to go into a charge controller, which is going to charge your batteries. For my presentation, we're not going to discuss uh, systems that are tied to the public utilities grid systems, grid tied systems. We're not going to talk about that. We want to talk about people who are not dependent on the grid and who don't want anything to do with the grid. So you'll have to have a charge controller because the energy from your solar panels has got to go somewhere and it's going to go into a battery bank. And the battery bank needs to be charged and it needs to be charged carefully and accurately and the charge controller takes care of that for you. The energy from your battery bank also needs to become useful energy to power your home and the appliances in it. And for most people, the easiest way to do that is to convert the battery power, your DC power, into AC power so that all your existing appliances think they're just plugged into the utility. So thankfully, there's products that do this, and they're called inverters. And the power from the battery bank feeds the inverter. So let's just say for the sake of conversation, you have a 48 volt battery system and it has 48 volts DC going into this power inverter. And by magic, the output of the power inverter is 120 volts AC. So you can plug in your microwave or your TV or your com computer and it thinks it's just plugged into the, your normal PSNH or whatever state you're from. And then, let's see, what do we have? Most people would want an AC generator as well because if you are off-grid and you have uh, several days of no sun, you're going to rapidly deplete your battery power and you need to be, keep the batteries charged to a certain level or they'll be ruined. Uh, 
So the, the generator serves two purposes. It can actually, three purposes. It can charge your batteries in low sunlight conditions. It can also be used to power large loads like water heaters or uh, I don't know if you're really uh, excessive, your jacuzzi. And um, it will also take care of, um, uh, what did I say, the battery charging and, and the loads. Those are the, those are the two main things. But if you have a, a well pump or something that draws a large load, you may want the generator on for that so you're not uh, depleting your batteries for that. So most systems are going to include a generator. And then there'll be some sort of a... Um, electronic metering system to show you how much power you're putting in, how much power you're taking out. And, and then, of course, the battery banks. And so one of the things that people always ask me is, how, much, how many batteries do I need? And, and, and they'll always have something in their head like, yeah, I, I saw online I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get two solar panels and a couple of car batteries, but they're going to be deep cycle car batteries. So I should be good, right? And I'll say, well, how, how long do you... How long do you want to be able to supply power to your, to your home, to your lights? Let's just say lights. Oh, I don't know, uh, 24 hours. Okay. And what if there's no sun for three or four days? Oh, yeah, well, I'll need to, I'll need to be able to do something for three or four days. So suddenly the, the, the simplistic view that I'm going to have two solar panels that let's just say they're just for the sake of round numbers, 200 watts apiece. So we got 400 watts of solar panels, and we got, we've got two, um, two car batteries, uh, excuse me, deep cycle boat batteries, marine batteries, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get a maybe uh, uh, 150 amps out of those uh, capability, uh, out of those batteries. So they'll say, well, my lights are only, I'm gonna put in LED lights. They're, they're only gonna draw, uh, they're only going to draw, if I have them all on, maybe five amps. Well, let, let's, let's, let's be kind. We'll say it's only going to draw two amps. And I say, okay, so you're going to draw two amps all night. Let's say 10 hours. That's 20 amps. Two, two amps times 10 hours, 20 amp hours. All right? The battery was 75 amp hours. So now you've taken, in one day, you've taken 20 amps just to run a few LED lights and not sit in the dark, all right? By day three, you've taken 60 amps out of the 75 amp battery. You haven't, been ha you haven't had any way to replenish it. So you've taken 90% of the power the battery had. Well, but it's okay, it's a deep cycle battery. This is incorrect, all right? So one of the most important things that I, I wanna get across to you guys today is that when you size your batteries, or when you think about batteries and how many you're gonna need, it's way more than you think. So let's, let's see why. If we go to the, um, the graph on the third page, they have a thing called depth of discharge. And there's a, there's a thing called cell life versus depth of discharge. Most people aren't aware of this. It's all on the internet. You can find everything that I have in this document on the internet very easily just by Googling the keywords. So what happens is you've got these two deep cycle marine batteries. You've gone three days using your LED lights. You'd like to use the microwave now, but unfortunately the battery is pretty much depleted. So what do you do about this? Well, you need more batteries. You need many more batteries. And here's the reason why. If you have, I'm gonna change the number now from a 75 amp hour battery to 100 amp just because it's a simpler number to work with for everyone. So you have 100 amp hour batteries. If you take your 100 amp hour battery and you discharge it, 80% of it, so there's only, you take 80 amp hours out of it, the life of the battery is gonna be reduced dramatically. Okay, so you don't wanna take more than 50% of the life of the battery out at any given time. A lot of people don't do this. A lot of people get, uh, will take 70, 80%, 90%. They'll nearly kill the battery before they recharge it. And then they wonder why, geez, I, had, I just bought these expensive batteries last year and now I have to replace them. Okay, that's just the reason. Depth of discharge. Not too many people know about this. It's very important. If you look at this graph, 
If I have a battery that's capable, this, this uh, 5,000 number is kind of high, so let, let's go with some, something in the mid-range. If I have a battery that's capable of 1,000 recharges, right, in the, right about the center of the chart there, and you look down below, you'll see 50. So that means at 50% discharge, okay, so if a 100 amp battery, we take 50 amps out. Just a minute. No, no, I'm talking about, I'm talking about sealed lead acid or gel batteries for, for this conversation. I, I'm, I'm not recommending uh, flooded batteries unless they're uh, nickel iron, but that's another, that's another topic. So f for, uh, and, and really this applies as well to flooded batteries, only the effects aren't as severe, okay? Flooded like car, car bat lead acid in liquid form, okay? So for sealed lead acid batteries or valve regulated lead acid batteries or gel cells or, what, or whatever you want to call them, we can go into the chemistries later if you want to talk about it. So at 50% discharge, the battery is going to last 1,000 cycles. So if you were to, to take 50% every day, then we're talking less than two years of battery life. Now, the battery isn't going to be dead after 1,000 charges. The, the, the rule of thumb is it, when it loses 80% of its capacity, um, they consider it to be uh, on the way out. But batteries will actually last a lot longer than that. But for my point here, you'll see that if you take 100% of capacity, you get down to about 300 charge, discount, charge discharge cycles. So if you take more than 50% of the battery's capacity, you're going to cut its life worse than in half. All right? And the batteries are going to be expensive. You're not going to want to use batteries that you get at Sam's Club. And the batteries can last 10 years. How do you make them last 10 years? I have batteries that, have, that I've had for more than 10 years. And the way you make them last way more than a couple of years is you only discharge them 20%. So you leave 80% in the battery. So what does that mean? It means that you need 80% more battery power than you think you do, all right? So if you think you're gonna use five amps for a day, you really gotta size that up to 40 amps per day so that you only take a fraction of the energy that the batteries are capable of out of them at any given time. Is, is, is this clear or should I make a better example? Anybody get, not getting this that wants me to explain it more clearly? So if you discharge the battery, it's like, let's just say I had an LED flashlight and I leave it on and I leave it on every day until the battery dies. By the, by the end of the first six months, that flashlight's going to be nearly useless. The batteries aren't going to want to recharge anymore. Okay. If I just turn the battery on for an hour every day and then I shut it off and I charge it, that, that flashlight will last 10 years. Is it the same for cell phones? It is related for cell phones because even the lithium batteries in the cell phones have a limited number of charge-discharge cycles. And so my cell phone, which I've had for seven years, has the same battery because I religiously put it on the charger every night whether it needs it or not. My wife's cell phone, who's it's the same age, not my, she's not the same age, but the cell phone battery is the same age. She's already on her third battery because she will let the thing run out and then it's completely depleted. And so, yes, it, it applies to most batteries. Some chemistry is worse than others. So when you're looking at websites and you try and decide how much that solar system is going to cost and how many batteries do I need, keep in mind that you, you can't take the capacity of the battery as it's rated. So if it's a 100 amp hour battery, you're only going to take 20 amp hours out, 30 amps, 40 amps. I mean, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. If you take 50% out once in a while, that's okay. You really want to avoid going to the 80% level. Of course, in an emergency, in an emergency, anything goes, so you would do that. And they're not going to be destroyed by going to 80% once in a while. But when you spend 150, 250, 300 dollars a battery. You want them to last 10 years, otherwise it, it's not going to be very cost effective, all right? Okay, so anyway, that's what that, that I want you to pay attention to that chart of uh, depth of discharge. Let me just see if there's any, another hot point I want to give you here. 
Uh, you'll hear talk about inverters. The inverters, you'll see them advertised. You've probably all seen the little uh, inverters that plug into your car cigarette lighter. Uh, you don't want to build a system that uses one of those. You'll find them online. You'll see them 1,000 watts, 1,500 watts, 2,000 watts, only 99.95. Do not use those, okay? They're not designed to work in these types of systems, they have a, uh, they have the waveform output of these inverters is not good. It's usually called a square wave, and uh, it will, it's just, it's not effective. It will damage your equipment. If you want to ask questions about it, that's fine. So what you really want is the sine wave inverter. Most modern uh, inverters that you're going to buy f the design for solar systems are going to be sine wave inverters, and all that means is that the power that's coming out of them almost is almost virtually identical to the quality of the power, it's, if not better, than what you get uh, from the public utility. So you can run any appliance that you have. It's gonna, it won't know the difference. You don't have to worry about your TV failing prematurely or your computer not working right. All right, so it's the sine wave inverter. Don't pay any attention to those square wave inverters. Uh, you can go with, there's a modified square wave with a, you can ask me about that later, but that's, that's a good way to save a few dollars, but the price difference isn't worth it anymore. It used to be that modified sine wave was probably uh, one third or half the price of the sine wave, but today with modern electronics, that's not true. Uh, there's grid tie inverters where you sell power back to the grid, but back to the utility company. As I say, I, I prefer not to do that. Um, if you have a grid tie system, you may not even need batteries. If you don't care about uh, having backup in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a situation where the public utility is out, you don't even need batteries at all. If all you want to redu do is reduce your electric bill, then you could have a, put solar panels on your house and sell power to the electric company. And in, an, in essence, the electric company becomes your battery. Much more time do I have? <laughs> a minute? That's not enough. Um, You'll also uh, see discussions on 12-volt um, inverters, 24-volt inverters, 48-volt inverters, all those ones that plug into your car cigarette lighter, 12 volts, no good. You need to go with 24 volts and preferably 48 volts. Uh, the heftiness, if you will, of the wiring that you need goes down dramatically. Where the wire is extremely expensive. You have to interconnect the wires with uh, excuse me, interconnect the batteries with wires that are nearly a half an inch in diameter. And so that's a lot of copper. And the, the, those prices, like, it's like welding cable, if you're familiar with that. So those prices uh, add up fast. So if you went with a 12-volt system, the wire is, 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 let's just say, size one. And if you go with a 24-volt system, it's going to be half of that size. If you go with a 48-volt system, it's, it's going to be half of that size. So you can save a ton of money just by uh, sizing your battery bank to a, a higher voltage, which is very easy to do nowadays. Used to be a problem, not anymore. All, all this equipment is standard and off the shelf. If, you're, uh, if, you've, got, um, uh, if you've got 220 uh, requirements, if you've got heavy equipment or you're a woodworker and you need that kind of power, uh, you can stack inverters so you don't have to be stuck with just 120. If, you, if you're uh, in some kind of uh, semi-industrial hobby or whatever. Uh, so you can get 220 as well. Uh, I guess we're going to do questions. Yep, so um, it, it appears that there isn't a talk after this, so we might have a few extra minutes. Um, I just want to talk just for a couple of minutes real quick on the grease car and how that's different than biodiesel, and then we'll open it up to questions. So the, the grease car method is, and uh, Bob mentioned this a little bit, is you take s just straight vegetable oil. Uh, ideally, it's been dewatered and filtered. And in a, in a vehicle engine, what you need to do is to heat it up. If you heat it up to about 170 degrees, what happens with oil when you heat it up to that? The viscosity drops. So the viscosity is similar to that of diesel. And the way you would do that on a uh, vehicle is you would tap into the uh, water system that cools the engine. You have it come in and coil in a heat exchanger into a separate tank that would heat that oil up. And then when it's at 170 degrees, you on, on your panel, you 
get that notice, you switch over. A solenoid will then switch where the fuel pump is drawing from. That heated oil actually goes in a fuel line that's, that has the uh, a water line around it that's running your hot engine coolant through it. And uh, it'll then inject it in the engine. Now, uh, a few caveats are, it's not anything you should do on a modern car. And what I mean by a modern car, I'm talking uh, any, any Volkswagen, any Mercedes, uh, that, that's a recent car. And the reason for that is it does, do, uh, it does put a lot of strain on the fuel pump. So an old Mercedes, an old pickup truck, even newer pickup trucks, uh, if the fuel pump can handle it, then it's something you, know, you could consider. The question is, would I put a rough year on the Volkswagen? I, in 94 or 95 is when Volkswagen started coming out with their turbo diesels, and that's when the fuel pumps really got expensive. And, and the reason that modern cars are not susceptible to that is in order to comply with emissions and government regulations, uh, what they're doing is they're increasing the pressure that the fuel pump will drive that diesel fuel through a nozzle. And the higher the pressure, means you can get more fuel through a smaller opening and when you do that it atomizes the fuel a lot better so you get a more complete combustion but because of that running uh, a heated oil system on a modern car can can damage that fuel pump so with that i'd like to open it up to just questions about any of the things we spoke about uh, if you could use the microphone that would be great um, yeah, you can turn it on Okay, thanks guys. I got two questions. I got one for you and one for you. Uh, have you experimented with using something other than uh, diesel fuel to thin out your biodiesel, like say uh, alcohol? It's my understanding that diesels can run on pretty much anything, uh, including wood gas. I don't know if you knew about this, but you can run a diesel off of 90% wood gas with just enough diesel oil to uh, start the ignition. Uh, I've seen that done and talked to people who've done it done. So I'm wondering if you've ever used anything other than diesel to thin your uh, fuel. And also, too, uh, I was wondering if you had ever considered using your producer gas to fire one of those gasoline generators or in, in replacement of most of your diesel, if you'd ever experimented with that or used that. So, two questions. So the, the first part of the question is, um, have I thinned out biodiesel with any, anything? And uh, the answer is no, I don't need to, because once it is biodiesel, it's at, it's at the correct viscosity that's similar to diesel, so that's how the engine was made. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned there was a problem with the, the fuel clouding under very cold conditions. Clogging under cold conditions. Clouding, clouding right. Um, there are additives. I, I would rather use an additive instead of just putting in more methanol. Methanol is expensive. So if you're paying $4 for methanol and you're using it at a 20% ratio to make biodiesel, that's cheap. If you're putting in methanol in order to keep running biodiesel, you've just wiped out those savings. So uh, there are add additives, but if the reality is when it's 20 degrees below zero, you're not going to run biodiesel. You're not going to run heated oil. You know, it's just not possible. Okay, uh, that was a great question. Uh, I have a, behind that green uh, diesel engine is a standalone uh, reactor. And it's piped into a Kohler. It's a two-cylinder engine. And it has regenerative heat. So the heat that comes out of the engine goes back into the container, this hopper. And it, it's uh, drying it. And it starts that pyrolysis, which is breaking down the wood fibers into the gases. So I have done that. But I haven't hooked it into my system. And I've only run it a few times. Uh, one of the reasons is um, the opposite of why I liked the big unit, because I only need a chainsaw to run that. The other one, which is what this gentleman was just asking about, I have to run the wood through a chipper. I, and I do have the proper chipper. You need a biomass chipper. I don't shred it. A lot of the wood chippers are shredders. I have to chip it. So my chipper is a real chipper, and it has this big, massive disc with blades in it that rotate. And as the wood goes through, it actually shaves off pieces. Then you have to sort it by size, and then you have to dry it. It works great, but you've got to do all that prep. So what I'm going to do, I 
keep promising myself the next winter when it's all snowy outside, I'm going to make a dryer, or like an automatic thing that'll dry and make a rotating drum to sort out the sizes. Okay. <laughs> I have a question for Bill. You're the solar guy. Have you built your own panels, or do you purchase them? Uh, I don't think it's... Okay, so the build, build or purchase. You know, you see all these videos on YouTube of people building their own panels on the picnic table in their backyard and, 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 and pouring the acrylic, and it looks tempting, you know, and they, they, they have these little boxes with all, the <laughs> with all the modules in them, and, you know. But if you actually research it online and uh, look at the prices, they're a dollar a watt is not uncommon now, and you really can't build it yourself for a dollar a watt. Yeah. You know, so I would say don't bother trying to build it yourself at this point. I spent the last two years building solar panels, and so I think I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I looked at it, and I was like, hmm, wow, this doesn't look bad. I can do this. Uh, Maybe even automate the semi-automate the process. But, like, why bother? You know, the, the yeah. Chinese people or the Chinese uh, manufacturers are, are dumping the panels. I got good at it, except that um, finding something to laminate them. You know, right. it was inexpensive. Right. That Very stuff expensive. That on is crap, and then you put a glass on the back. Well, that's fragile. So I started doing silicon caulk just all over the place. Yeah. That's not so bad, actually, but yeah. it's expensive. And then I used patio glass doors, which unfortunately have a reflective property in the glass. Mm -hmm. You know, I got the non-reflective kind, so I don't know. I would guess I would tell people to, to right. purchase as well, but... And yeah. you'll see the videos where they tell you yeah. where to get the actual commercial material to coat the, f to yeah. coat the front and to seal the back with the vacuum and the heat and all this. It's definitely not worth it. You're never going to come up with a panel that's as good as what you can buy for, the, for less money and no effort. So, no, don't try and build your own. Forget those videos. Less, less than a dollar a watt. Yeah, I know, but, you know, it was fun, though, right? Right. It's a good project, but, you know, build one or two, but not... Any other questions? Do you know anybody that has had experience mixing gasoline with cleaned oil and running it in a Volkswagen? Not personally. I mean, I've, I've seen talk on, on the websites and on the forums that people have been successful with that. So I, I know it is possible. It's just not anything that, that I've tried. I've got some friends that claim to have done it, but I'm afraid to try it myself. Right. It, it, it's all about, uh, you know, you want to get it to the right viscosity because everything on that engine and, and, and fuel system has been tweaked and engineered for a certain range of, of viscosity of fuel. So if they can hit that, then, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of folks out there that have done it. I, I just haven't personally done it. It's a lot easier than making biodiesel. I do experiment a little bit with my little engine. So uh, one thing I would caution you on is uh, the detonation. If you're adding these highly volatile things like gasolines to things like oils, that, that thing is going to kick off earlier on the compression stage. I had a friend, and I know he did this, and, and this was the first time I'd heard about it. He had a Volkswagen Rabbit, and he was mixing it 50-50 in the winter, and I thought he was insane. No, I'm not saying but, it can't be I done. But I saw him do it, and I've mixed 25% myself when it gets 20 below without any problems. For years, I've done it. So, yeah, I'm just not saying you can't yeah. do it. I'm just saying if you don't get it right. Right, yeah. I think if you went over 50%, that's where you'd have your problem. So you, you mentioned the, a Volkswagen Rabbit. So I'm taking that's, that's an older... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. 84 was the last year they made those. So the more mechanical the diesel engine is and the less modern it is, the more forgiving it, it is for that. So I, I can definitely, I mean, people have done that a lot with old Mercedes. I mean, those engines were built like tanks. Uh, everything in them was pretty much mechanical. Uh, now everything's computer controlled. It, it still can be done. Um, but, you know, like, like Bob mentioned, you are mixing, you know, volatile uh, chemicals, especially things like gasoline. So if you do it outside and all, and I, I recommend if you're going to make biodiesel, I would make it outside. I had everything on wood dollies and plywood, so I would have physically move it onto my driveway. And, and then that way, if you spill some of this stuff, it's, 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 you know, it's going out into the, 
into the general air. You don't want to make biodiesel in your basement. That is a great way to burn down your house. I got another question. The, um, you said you run nickel iron and you're running lead acid, but you have to, I know nickel irons are almost indestructible, but they're really expensive. Is there a balance because you can get a smaller number of nickel iron because you can draw them right down? I mean, you know the answer to that? Uh, I have the nickel iron, uh, yes. Uh, the thing about them is the disadvantages are that they're much bigger, mm -hmm. they're heavier, uh, but Your they do have some. Mine though, right? Yeah, but they, but I don't drive around with them, so they're all in my workshop on the concrete floor, so it's okay. Right. However, they have other advantages, which are the very long-lived. Right. There are guys I've seen, of course, I on the internet, but they claim that they've been running this, these nickel iron batteries since Thomas Edison. Right. So they're very long-lived, and I can drain them 100, almost 100 percent down, and not kill them. Right. Or hurt. Yeah, so I, I can, like, uh, I did a battery test yesterday. I have 800 amp hour batteries, and I drew it down to 725 amp hours. So it worked great. At what point does your voltage start to really drop off when you start getting down there? Uh, I have a, my system is designed for 48, and it's when it was around negative 700, like this was around 44 volts. Good. We're good. Any any other questions? Bob, you said your greenhouse. Now you do not. It didn't look like those were hydroponics, right? And do you, what do you have a yay or nay favor disadvantage advantage of those systems compared to dirt? Well, the reason I I put up the greenhouse is uh, not because I was getting ready for the crash. And if I, I've been long, long time, since I was like 13 years old, interested in health, nutrition, and I'm an old guy, so I'm, a, I'm over 60, all right? It's been a long time. So I want to grow my own food, and my food is medicine. It's not just to fill my stomach. And I understand how nature works with the soil, with the roots, with the beneficial soil organisms, with the type of rock dust we put in there, and the worms, and all the stuff. And it makes healthy food, which makes healthy people. So don't have to go to the doctors and get the health insurance and all the vaccines and everything else, which I don't want it. Okay, so. So the hydroponics, don't impart the nutrients to the plant? Right, not the way I understand it, no. Okay. What about um, aquaponics, adding the fish? Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, the fish, of course, they, they provide that fertilizer, their output, <laughs> which, you know, I haven't really studied that that much, but I think back as to how nature really wanted these things to grow, and I want to give it what it needed from the beginning. I don't want to recreate that because then I wind up getting back to what we got now, which is an absolute disaster in food. All the food is really garbage. And we can talk a lot about that. That's where I get excited about talk about food. This other stuff is just so I can get the food. All right, uh, we're way over, but uh, I encourage uh Anyone that still has questions will be here for a little bit, and obviously throughout the rest of Porkfest, uh, please feel free to come up to us at any time and ask any questions you might have. Thank you.